It's been 20 years since Alfa Romeo made a front-engined rear-wheel drive luxury sedan, and that's exactly what we have our hands on here today, the all-new Alfa Romeo Giulia. Now, this is not the fire-breathing Giulia Quadrifoglio that you've probably seen other people review. Instead, I deliberately asked for the most popular model, the TI trim. In the United States, the Giulia will come in three different trims to start with. We have the base trim, we have the TI trim, which stands for Turismo Internazionale, and then we have the fire-breathing quadrifolio trim, which translates to four-leaf clover. Of course, I'm sure if I have mispronounced any of these things, people will instantly let me know down there in the comments section below. The Giulia is an incredibly important model for Alfa Romeo and for FCA in general, because this vehicle right here will be the basis for a variety of different Alfa Romeo luxury sedans and crossovers in America, as well as possibly some Alfa Romeo cousins in the Dodge and Chrysler family. But the model we're taking a look at today is the compact luxury sedan that is targeted very directly at the BMW 3 Series. Before we continue, we should address one thing right up front. I have noticed a lot of people on our Facebook page incorrectly assume that this is closely related to some other Fiat Chrysler product at the moment, and that's not the case. The Giulia is an all-new model for Alfa Romeo, and its only close relation is the upcoming Stelvio crossover. That means that for better or for worse, inside this cabin or outside the vehicle, you really won't find parts that are shared with any other FCA vehicle. Up front, we get the very distinctive Alfa Romeo V-shaped grille, and then on either side of that, we have the larger cooling ducts that provide the majority of the engine cooling. Over here on the passenger side is where we find the radar adaptive cruise control sensor in this particular model. Xenon headlamps are standard, but there are two different lamp modules. The module we're taking a look at here does not steer in the corners. If you get the top end trims, then they do steer and they become a little bit brighter as well. All trim levels have this LED accent strip inside the headlamp module, and then we also have LED cornering lamps integrated into the lamp module. They're inboard of the Xenon lamp module and they shine over to the side when you turn the wheel. Helping accentuate the angry look of the Giulia, this is about 2 inches wider than a BMW 3 Series at 73.7 inches wide overall. As you'd expect out of a European company, Alfa Romeo decided to give us a vehicle that is almost exactly the same size as a BMW 3 Series instead of trying to give us a vehicle that was a half step larger for the same price. That means that at 182.6 inches long, only fractions of an inch separate this model from the BMW. That also means that we'll find less interior room than something like the Audi A4 or the Infiniti Q50, which are on the larger end of the scale, although we do find a little bit more room, especially in the back seat, than something like a Volvo S60, which is at the smaller end of the scale, down there with the Lexus IS. From the side profile, the rear wheel drive proportion of the Giulia is very obvious, and this is what is very different about this model than the previous Alfa Romeo sedans that we have seen over the last 20 years or so. When designing the Giulia, Alfa Romeo's mission for this sedan was to resurrect their performance credentials, and by giving this a rear wheel drive layout, they also were able to give this a perfect 50-50 weight balance. To that end, Alfa uses a variety of different advanced materials to make the vehicle, including aluminum body panels, high strength steel components, and a carbon fiber drive shaft in every model. Out back, we find standard LED tail lamp modules. The majority of the lamp is over here on the body side, although there is a portion that extends over here to the trunk lid. Dual exhaust tips are standard in the base and the TI trim that we're driving right here. If you get the quadrifolio, then you actually get quad exhaust tips across the back. You'll notice that on the driver's side, we have a Q4 badge, and that's because we're driving the model with all-wheel drive today. At the moment, there are just two engines under the hood for the United States market. Things start out with this 2-liter 4-cylinder turbocharged engine. This is what you'll find in most of the Julias on the dealer lot. This is an all-new engine for Alpha, and it features all of the latest FCA technologies, including direct injection and multi-air 2. Power comes in at a very healthy 280 horsepower and 306 pound-feet of torque. Keep in mind that this is the base engine in the Julia, so this competes not with the likes of the BMW 340i, but really the BMW 320i and the BMW 330i. So this is a great deal more power in the base trim than we find in the competition. Power is sent to the rear wheels by default via a ZF 8-speed automatic transmission from Germany, and that'll get you 27 miles per gallon combined. If you opt for the all-wheel drive system that we're driving right here, that drops down to 26. The next engine is the one that everybody has been talking about, of course, the 2.9-liter V6 engine designed by Ferrari for the Alfa Romeo Giulia. The six-cylinder engine is very closely related to the V8 that we find in the Ferrari California, and you can really think of that engine as the V8 engine missing two cylinders with some additional tweaks to fit under this hood. 
power comes in at a whopping 505 horsepower and 443 pound-feet of torque. You'll notice that there is obviously a huge chasm in terms of power delivery between this 2-liter engine and the 2.9-liter V6. And that's why the rumor mill is telling us that we should expect to see a 350 horsepower version of this same engine in the next year or so. If we do see a 350 horsepower four-cylinder engine out of Alfa Romeo, then that engine would be the one that would compete with the likes of the Audi S4 or the BMW 340i. Taking a closer look at the engine, you can see that this was definitely designed to help reduce turbo lag because the turbocharger is right over here on the driver's side of the engine, coupled very close to the exhaust manifold. The engine then uses a water-to-air intercooler system across the top that helps reduce the length of plumbing versus a traditional air-to-air -air intercooler. That means that although we do see some turbo lag out of this 2-liter engine, it's an awful lot lower than many of its competitors. I'm going to give front seat comfort in the model we're driving 8 out of 10 points. All Julia models come standard with a 4-way adjustable lumbar support and an electric driver's seat. However, the base seat design is a little bit firm for my tastes, and the seat bottom cushion is a little bit short, so people with longer legs may find that this doesn't give them the support they're looking for. The score goes up a little bit if you get the optional sport seats available in the Julia because they are just a little bit more comfortable. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion. Keep in mind that this is a very competitive luxury segment, so options with extending thigh cushions, inflatable side bolsters, or four-way adjustable headrests are going to be more configurable and more comfortable for some people. Hopping in the back, I'm going to give this 7 out of 10 points because headroom is quite limited. We are in the model with the dual pane moonroof and that really does cut down on rear headroom a great deal. In addition to that, we find a little less legroom than in some of the competition. Sitting right here behind myself, I have about 2 inches of legroom left, but if I try and move over to the right side of the vehicle, where the front seat was adjusted for a 6 foot 5 passenger, I really have troubles fitting my feet in the footwell and my knees are definitely digging into the seat back. As we see in most compact luxury cars, the center seat in the back is positioned a little bit higher off the ground and a little bit further forward than the outboard seating positions, meaning I have a little bit less legroom and definitely less headroom. When it comes to cargo capacity, the trunk in the Julia is notably smaller than the BMW 3 Series. In our 24-inch roller bag test, we were only able to fit three bags in the Julia, but some of the entries in this compact segment will be able to accommodate four bags in the back. That's all because of how the cargo area is shaped. I have a 22 inch roller bag here. You'll notice it does not roll all the way to the back because the cargo area is not quite square in the back. If I put it on its side like this, then it will go a little bit further into the trunk. In addition to that, we have a subwoofer that sticks down quite far into the trunk, meaning that the center 24 inch roller bag could not have gone on its side. As we see in many European vehicles, the Julie was not designed to accommodate a spare tire. So under the cargo area load floor, we find an additional storage area right there, some fuses, and then most of that area is actually hidden by this styrofoam insert. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in sort of a mid-level TI trim, and we do have this dual pane moonroof. You can see that we have one small pane right back there over the rear passenger's heads. It has a manual sunshade, and then we have a larger one over here for the front passenger and driver, and this has an electric shade. Both front seats have fixed height shoulder belts, and we have two-way adjustable headrests in this cabin with the Alfa Romeo logo embossed in the center. The leather upholstery in this particular model is somewhere between a tan and sort of a cream color. You notice that we have a fairly short seat bottom cushion, as I mentioned earlier, and the bolstering is more aggressive on the back of the seat than the bottom of the seat. As you'd expect out of a luxury car, the upper portions of the door are made from either a soft touch injection molded plastic or the stitched leather that we see in this particular model, and then the lower portion of the door is made from a hard touch plastic right around the speaker grill and this bottle holder. The stitched leather door panels and dashboard are optional, but this is definitely an option that I would recommend because it really dresses up the interior. If we zoom out from there, you can see more of that stitched leather dashboard. We have real wood trim and then soft touch injection molded plastics for the lower portion of the dash. The glove compartment is a combination bin and slot style compartment. It is fairly small. I was not able to fit a tablet computer inside. In the center of the dash, we have this large plastic piece with an anti-reflective coating, and then behind it, we have one of two different screens. Ours is the up-level system, which has the larger 8.8-inch infotainment screen and the navigation software standard. This system is very different than FCA's other infotainment products. It uses a control knob, very much like Audi MMI or Mercedes Command, and there's no touch screen. Navigating around the system is fairly intuitive if you have used any of the other rotary dial navigation systems. We have a phone interface for your Bluetooth smartphone. There's also a navigation interface as you'd expect, but this is a little unusual in the luxury car segment because you really cannot zoom very far out in this map. We also don't have live traffic and the map cannot go full screen. 
This system is also where you would check vehicle status like your tire pressure, your maintenance schedule, your oil level in the engine. You can of course get your driving efficiency scores and this is also where you would change vehicle settings. The lower section of the display also mirrors your climate control settings. Below the infotainment display we have two large air vents with open and closed knobs and then we have the controls for the two zone climate control system. Below that we find a single USB input and then behind this roller cover we have two large cup holders. The shifter is a joystick style shifter that we see in many European vehicles. There's a button on the back. We push that in and pull towards the driver for drive, push away from the driver for reverse, and then neutral is one click in the middle. We pull over to the left for the manual mode once we're in drive, and then we toggle away from the driver for gear down, pull towards the driver for gear up. If you want to park the car, we simply press the P button right up top. Behind that we have a rotary drive mode selector knob that allows you to choose between dynamic, normal, and advanced efficiency. A nice touch in this system is that obviously since this is a physical knob it stays in that drive mode even when you turn the car off and then back on. On the other side we find the volume knob for the infotainment system. We press down for mute, rotate it around for volume, and then toggle side to side for track forward and backward. Behind the volume and drive mode selectors, we find the infotainment control. This is a rotary style control, as I said earlier. It toggles up, down, side to side, clicks down to enter, and rotates around. There's an option button, and then a menu button that takes you back to the main menu in the system. Although this looks like it might offer handwriting recognition or finger writing recognition because of the large size of the dial, this does not offer that feature. Between the front seats, we have a leather center armrest. This opens to reveal a small storage cubby where you can just barely fit an iPhone 7 Plus, wallets, keys, that sort of thing. Inside this cubby, we have an additional USB input, an auxiliary input, and a 12 volt power port. The instrument cluster features two large analog dials for the tachometer on the left, speedometer on the right, and then we have some digital gauges for the engine temperature over here, and then the fuel gauge on the other side. In the center of that, we have a color multifunction LCD. This LCD is where you'll find things like your trip computer readouts, the digital speedometer. We also have a G graph. This little dot in the center will move side to side and forward and backward as you drive. And then this changes depending on the mode that we're in. So if we're in the normal mode or the advanced efficiency mode, we see slightly different graphs here. The steering wheel is a flat bottom three spoke design with sport grips up top. And interestingly, we find the engine start stop button on the wheel itself. The right side of the steering wheel is where we find infotainment controls as well as a phone button and a dedicated voice command button. And then on the left side we have the controls for the cruise control or the radar adaptive cruise control if your model has that. The multifunction display between the speedometer and tachometer is controlled via this button on the windshield wiper stock. When you get out on the road there are a few things that are obvious right away. The first is that this engine produces an awful lot more power than most of the competition's base engines. Again this is 280 horsepower and over 300 pound-feet of torque. The next thing you'll notice about this engine is that it is a little rough around the edges. We definitely get more four-cylinder engine noise into the cabin, and it definitely idles a little bit rougher than the average four-cylinder in this category. However, this engine will take you from zero to 60 notably faster than the average engine in this category. Zero to 60 happen in five seconds in this particular model. It goes up to 5.1 if you get the rear-wheel drive model because traction does become an issue. Traction becomes an issue in the rear-wheel drive model because of the size of the rear tires and the mass massive amount of torque coming out of this engine. Again, 300 pound-feet of torque, and that's happening at very, very low RPMs thanks to the way this engine is designed, the positioning of the turbo, and the fact that we have that water-to-air intercooler. 0-60 to 60 in 5 seconds is a full 1.8 seconds faster than a 2-liter turbocharged Lexus IS. A 5 second 0 to 60 time is very impressive for a car like this. To keep this in perspective, this is only a half second slower 0 to 60 than the Lexus GSF and only about two tenths of a second slower than the Infiniti Q50 Red Sport if you opt for the rear wheel drive model. 5 seconds is obviously lovely, but this is not a BMW 340i competitor or an Audi S4 competitor. That may happen later because as I said earlier, we expect to see something like 350 horsepower in a different tune of this 2 liter engine at some point. And that's going to plug the massive gap between the performance numbers in this and the insane performance numbers that we find in the Quadrifoglio version. Keeping in mind again that this is not a 340i competitor, braking distances come in average for a base entry in this segment at 124 feet. That's because this uses Bridgestone Taranza tires, which are sort of a fairly average mainstream luxury car tire, and they're a 225 width in terms of size. Keeping those tires and their size in mind, handling is absolutely incredible in the Julia. Not only does this grip the road very, very well, but the feel is what's incredible. 
The steering is quick, the car is very responsive to steering input, and we actually have some road feel coming back into the steering wheel. That's something that's really been missing in a lot of modern luxury cars thanks to electric power steering. The best way to describe the Julia is that this is just a joy to drive, and that is something that's missing in a large number of luxury cars, including BMW's latest cars. In a way, this does to the base luxury car segment what the Jaguar XE with its 3.0-liter supercharged engine does to the more powerful end of this segment. Because the Jaguar XE has an excellent handling feel out on the road, but it also has the urgency that we're lacking in something like a Cadillac ATS. Thanks to the design of this turbocharged engine and the massive amount of power and torque that we find for a base engine, this has an urgency that we just don't see in the BMW 320i or the Mercedes-Benz C300 or even the BMW 330i. And of course, it combines that with a handling dynamic that we haven't seen in BMW models for some generations. For a vehicle that obviously has a sporting mission in mind, the Julie has a fairly compliant suspension out here on rougher roads. Now, obviously, more road imperfections make their way into the cabin than something like a Lexus ES350, but this is very similar to the Lexus IS or the BMW 3 Series. The model that we're driving is the model with the standard suspension. There is an adaptive suspension available that will stiffen the ride and soften the ride on either side of what we're seeing in this car. In our cabin noise test, we scored 70 and a half decibels at 50 miles an hour, which makes this a little bit louder than the average average entry in this segment. One thing worth noting is that we definitely have more four-cylinder engine noise coming into the cabin than you find in something like the Audi A4 or the BMW or definitely that Mercedes C300. The C300 has a very, very quiet cabin. Fuel economy has been fairly impressive in this car. We've been averaging 25 and a half miles per gallon, which is just a hair below what the EPA says you should get. That's a very respectable number for a car that makes 280 horsepower and has an all-wheel drive system. This all-wheel drive system is definitely tuned towards the performance end of things. Obviously, it locks up that clutch pack to send power to the front wheels to give you better grip, but it also keeps a lot of power to the rear, so it helps give this car a very definite rear-wheel drive dynamic. The all-wheel drive tuning in this car reminds me a great deal of the all-wheel drive Jaguar XE. When it comes to our overall fuel economy score, I'm going to give this an A-. This does very well for a vehicle with 280 horsepower, but it's obviously not going to be as efficient as those base models of the competition. When it comes to driving enjoyment, there is absolutely no question. This is simply more fun than any of the competition with which this competes. Again, keep in mind that this is not a BMW 340i competitor or an Audi S4 competitor or the competitor to something like the Jaguar XE with the 3.0-liter supercharged engine. This Julia competes with the four-cylinder entries in those manufacturers, even though performance-wise, it's actually a little bit closer to the six-cylinder entries. Now, obviously, more goes into luxury car selection than just the fun factor, so let's talk about the rest now. At the moment, the Julia comes only in three different trim levels, the base model, the TI model, and, of course, the really insane Quadrifoglio. The important thing to keep in mind when looking at the Julia's price tag is that there really is no corollary to the BMW 320i or really the BMW 340i. That's why the Julia on the surface appears to be more expensive than the mainstream competition, but it's actually less expensive once you've comparably equipped the 3 Series, the C-Class, etc. Once upon a time, the compact luxury car segment was really a segment of two vehicles. We had the BMW 3 Series and the Mercedes-Benz C-Class. Things are very different these days. We have the Audi A4, and then along came the Lexus IS, the Volvo S60, Cadillac ATS, Jaguar XE, Infiniti Q50, the Julia that we've been looking at this week, and then we have to factor in the models that we will be seeing very soon, like the Tesla Model 3, the Genesis G70, and even the Kia Stinger. That means that the segment is getting very crowded, and manufacturers are really trying hard to differentiate their vehicle from the competition. The Julia differentiates itself in two important ways. First, the base model is very fast. 0 to 60 in 5.1 seconds is definitely the fastest in this group. Second, the base price is actually quite low when you take a look at the standard equipment and you compare the Julia properly to the competition. It's very attractive inside and out. I really like the way the Julia is designed as well. On the downside, the passenger compartment is just not as accommodating as some of the larger competition. The infotainment system is also awkward to use. It's not nearly as intuitive as iDrive or MMI. And lastly, of course, reliability is a valid concern for the Alpha. They haven't really been known for creating reliable vehicles in Europe or in America in the past, and the Julia may be a little bit better than some of those other cars, but early indications already show that the Julia is having a few more problems than some of the competition's new models. 
When we dive into the competition, it's important to remember that the Julia is significantly faster than many of these competitors. It's half a second to three quarters of a second faster than all the entries that you're seeing on your screen. And that's why appropriately comparing the Julia is important, because this is not a competitor to the BMW 320i, the four-cylinder Infiniti Q50, the four-cylinder Cadillac ATS, or the Lexus IS200T. Instead, this is the more appropriate competition to the Jaguar XD with its new 296 horsepower engine, the IS350 V6, the Cadillac ATS with its 3.6 liter engine, the Q50 with a twin-turbo 300 horsepower V6, and of course the BMW 330i. When you take a look at this list of competitors and their zero to 60 times, and then the zero to 60 time that we clocked in our essentially base engined Julia, you'll really notice what I'm talking about here. That brings us along to the $38,750 BMW 330i. It manages to be a little bit more expensive than the base Julia, and we find a few fewer features in the BMW as well. The Julia is unquestionably more fun than the 330i to drive. It's just more engaging out on the road, it definitely handles a little bit better than the base models of the 330i, and it puts a bigger smile on your face while you're driving it. The trouble with the Julia is that it's not as well rounded as the BMW 330. BMW's 3 Series really is the Honda Accord of the luxury car segment, and that's not a diss on the 3 Series by any stretch. The BMW is extremely well rounded. Now it may not excel at everything in its category, but if you if you were to take a look at the features and functions of the 330i as sort of a spider chart, it would be almost a perfect circle. The infotainment system scores very highly, it scores highly when it comes to acceleration, handling, etc., but it's not going to be class leading necessarily in all of these categories. If we're talking about driver engagement and driver enjoyment, then hands down the Julia wins over the BMW. With every generation, the 3 Series has become larger and softer and more comfortable, and that really makes it more of a luxury vehicle than a performance vehicle these days. It's also worth noting that if you're looking for something a little bit outside the ordinary, something a little bit different than all of those other 3 Series you see on the road, you could get a Julia and it would definitely stick out in the crowd. It would also cost less, and that is an important factor here because we get more standard feature content in the Julia outside, of course, of that infotainment system than we find in the BMW 330i. On the performance side, it would, of course, be less expensive to buy a BMW M3 than an Alfa Romeo Julia Quadrifoglio. You'll notice I haven't really been talking too much about the Quadrifoglio in this particular video. That's because we haven't driven one for a complete week. And also because at Alex and Autos, we don't tend to focus on overt performance models like we do mainstream models. So there are outlets that are better at reviewing those cars. They have access to tracks where they can really compare track times and give those folks what they really want to know. That brings us along to the Jaguar XE, one of our favorite vehicles in this segment. The XE is also an excellent value, and that's really been Jaguar's sales proposition lately with a lot of their cars. But even compared against the Jaguar XE, the Julia is a better value. We also get much better performance out of its base engine than we see in the Jaguar XE. Now Jaguar does have their brand new 290 plus horsepower 2 liter 4 cylinder engine, but that still won't be quite as fast 0 to 60 as the base engine that we see in the Julia. It should get us from 0 to 60 in about 5.4 versus 5 to 5.1 in the Julia. The infotainment system is a weak point in the Jaguar XE as it is in the Julia. Although I do have to say that Jaguar's latest infotainment system ranks a little bit higher than what we see in the Julia. Obviously when it comes to Jaguars, people are a little bit concerned about reliability, but in general Jaguar's reliability has been better than Alpha. The Jaguar XE and the Julia remind me a great deal of one another because both are very focused on driver engagement. And that's something that we don't necessarily see in the Audi A4, the BMW 3 Series, or the Mercedes-Benz C-Class anymore. But like the Julia, the XE's back seat definitely feels small when you compare it to against the Audi A4 or the BMW 3 Series. Next up we have the Cadillac ATS. The ATS is one of the most fun to drive entries in this segment, but it is getting a little bit old. The interior in the ATS has never been one of my favorites in this segment, but it really is starting to show its age more and more. The instrument cluster itself, the overall design of the interior, and the cramped back seat that we see in the ATS definitely harken back to a different era in the compact luxury segment. In terms of overall performance, the Julia definitely competes with the 3.6 liter V6 that we see in the ATS, not the four cylinder turbos. But even with that 3.6 liter V6, the Julia is still going to be about a half second faster than the Cadillac to 60. Infiniti's Q50 continues to be one of the best deals in this compact luxury segment. We have a big back seat, a fairly large trunk, and the vehicle overall is a little bit larger than the average. But its price tag is definitely lower than many of the other entries. 
for $38,950, you could buy a base Q50 with their twin-turbo V6 engine. That 300 horsepower V6 will get you from 0 to 60 in about 5.4 seconds with rear-wheel drive, a little bit faster if you get the all-wheel drive model. Now that's not quite as fast as the Julia, but the twin-turbo V6 in the Q50 is more refined, and there's also a 400 horsepower version of that same engine that will definitely get you from 0 to 60 faster than the Julia. Now there is no direct competition to the Quadrifoglio in the Infiniti lineup, but you do have that next step up in terms of overall performance. The Infiniti Q50 Red Sport is an incredible deal in this segment. We get 400 horsepower, it's a ton of fun, and the price tag is definitely within the range of the Alfa Romeo Giulia in its standard 2.0-liter 4-cylinder engine trim. As much fun as the Q50 is, it's not going to be as engaging as the Alfa Romeo, especially if you get the Q50 with the direct adaptive steering or the steer-by-wire system, as some people call it. The steering feels very artificial in those top-end trims of the Q50. But on the flip side, the Q50 is again going to be a very, very good deal in this segment. Not quite as good of a deal as the Julia, depending on how you want to configure those two models, but it's going to be very, very close. My bottom line on the Julia is that if you're looking for something a little off the beaten path, this is definitely a compelling option in this segment. You just have to be willing to deal with the fact that it may not be as reliable as your 3 Series, and that infotainment system really needs a lot of work. But if you're really focused on the driving ability of the vehicle and the way the car makes you smile when you're driving it on your favorite winding mountain road, there really is very little competition in this segment. It's more engaging than the Cadillac ATS, and I think the Jaguar XE, although it comes close, is still not quite up to the same level as the Julia. My overall top pick in a segment has to still be the 2017 BMW 330i because it is such a well-rounded vehicle. At the moment, my top sporty pick has to continue being the 2017 Jaguar XE. It just seems to be a little bit better polished than the Julia overall. We also get that new nearly 300 horsepower four-cylinder engine, which definitely makes that model compare very well to the Julia. However, I think if Alfa Romeo worked a little bit on their reliability issues and tweaked their infotainment system, that it could replace the Jaguar XE on this list. The rumor mill tells us that 2018 may bring Apple CarPlay and Android Auto support to the infotainment system, and I think that really would push it over the edge for me. Be sure and let me know what you think about the Alfa Romeo Giulia down there in the comments section below, and I'll see you next week.